the night back by popular demand, our favorite esthetician, my favorite of course, the amazingly beautiful Judy Bakira Morrison. Judy, we're so excited to have you tonight. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. I, I enjoy coming here to see you, talk to your fans a little bit, give them a little bit of knowledge of what I have. Oh, just a little bit. Just how many bit. years? 18. 18 years, and you train. You've trained for train. how many years now? Well, almost 18 years. Right. Continuing so. education classes and instructor's classes. So you, you're hands-on. You still do it. In fact, mm -hmm. you're my favorite, absolutely, why I have such good skin. But also you train others in the procedures and the things that are important in today's skin care yes. and the whole world of skin. So tonight we're going to talk about something that I wish, if there's one thing I would have changed, in my life was to use sun protection at an earlier age. So we're gonna talk a little bit about sun protection. Okay, uh, there was an article in the paper, I guess last week, about SPF, the sun uh, factor. And uh, we get a little disillusioned with 100 SPF thinking we can put it on in the morning and it'll stay on all day, even if we are in and out of water, perspiration, in and out of a hot car, that's not true. Right. You have to reapply sunblock at least every two hours. And it has to be 30 plus. It doesn't matter if it's 40 or 50 or 60 or 100. You still have to reapply it. And I, yesterday, uh, we had our uh, eight-year-old grandson at the uh, water park. Right. And every time he came out of the water, which was not very really often, we reapplied a 30 on him. Right. He did a not 30. get burned mm -hmm. at all yesterday. Right. He did not even get a tan which was good. So I hadn't done that in many, many, many years. So I was watching, and he even, um, when he would get out of the water, he'd spray himself. So right. he knew, uh, and it was a spray, which seemed to be really good. Right, so just to um, refresh our audience as well as myself, because I'm a little confused on the different levels of it. So if it's a 30, a 40, a 50, a 60 to 100, is there really any difference after 30 plus? Not really. No. Not really. About mm -hmm. five years ago, I was at a continuing education seminar in um, Kansas City. And that it came out at that point that all of the sunblocks would only say 30 plus. And it, took a, it has taken a while, though, for all the companies to uh, change their labeling and that kind of thing. Right. But it is extremely important because if you, I have 100 on and I still got burned. Well, did you reapply? Right. No. And it's even in a car. If you're driving for over two hours, you have your hands on the steering wheel. You right. need to put your sun protection on your hands, especially women, especially right. the left side of your face. Mm -hmm. And you don't think about that because you think no. you're inside of a car, you're not really getting sun, but you are. Right. So the golden rule is you need 30 plus, At least. number one, and you need to apply every two hours. At least every two every hours. Every two hours. And every time you get out of a pool. Right. And we're going to tell our audience, because this is where it's really important, when you have really good sun protection, as an esthetician, what does it help our audience benefit from? Well, pigmentation. Hyperpigmentation is the culprit. Um, and then if you have any kind of a hormone disorder at the time, menopause or um, just being a young child going through hormonal changes, right. we can develop or pregnant women, melasma. Right. And that is extremely difficult to get rid of. You have to work at it very, you can lighten it, of course, right. but, but you have to be very consistent with it. And going out in the sun, if you miss a spot, it'll be as dark as can be. Well, and also sun protection eliminates lines, which Absolutely. is one thing that our audience is the right. most interested in. We want Line, to right. eliminate any, I mean, you're gonna get some lines just from age, right. but without sun protection, you know, you can bring on the lines because that's right. what's going to happen. You have to protect your face. Well, squinting. Mm -hmm. Squinting, exactly. If you don't wear sunblock and sunglasses, hat, when you squint, right. we see it, especially uh, on the outer corners of the eyes. Right. We're going to take a quick break. and we come back, we're going to talk about something that I've gotten so many emails on, and that's women experiencing menopause and how it wrecks havoc on their skin. Okay. All of that when we come back with Miss Judy Bakira Morrison. To view this entire episode or to view other past episodes, please visit our podcast site at podcast.debrakennedyshow.com. You can view the complete episodes right on the website or subscribe to the show via iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. Thanks for watching.
now back with Judy, a little bit about menopause and how it wreaks havoc on your skin. Judy, I mean, it is one of those things, you had a patient you were telling me about that you really saw that it damaged her skin. Let's talk about that first. Well, to see a patient come into the office for years and years and have absolutely beautiful skin and then all of a sudden, it's not. And it's menopause. Mm -hmm. The skin texture changes, the tone changes, and it seemed like no matter what we did um, and what we used, it helped, but it didn't take it back to the way it was before right. menopause. And this particular patient took 10 years off and on. And it was extremely difficult on her. And we did everything that we possibly could. Um, she looked good, right? but I could tell the difference with the texture. And doing good skin care, mm -hmm. of course, helped. Uh, now that she's finished, there's no problem. Right. But, but it was the 10 years of going through years, it that she yes. was just off and on. Off and on, Good right. skin, bad skin. Right. You know, right. for our viewers out there that are in the beginning phases of menopause yes. or at the ending phases of menopause, let's talk about some things that, that we can do okay. to make the transition a little easier and not really have the damaged skin. Right. Well, that's what we did with you. Absolutely. When you started going through the perimenopause, we started doing more aggressive peels using some clinical products. Right. that would help uh, cellular turnover uh, quicker than every three months because right. as we hit a certain, certain ages, we do not uh, exfoliate completely every 28 days right. like a 20-year-old. Right. So uh, skin, uh, a good skin care regimen and having skin care treatments gives you an exfoliation completely at one sitting right. so we can catch up during that time. And using, of course, really good peels. Mm -hmm. Jesner peels Jesner are peels wonderful. Jesner peels what you do. And, yes. and you can control the level. Like if, yes. you, Absolutely. Like if I'm doing something you know, in a few right. days, you're like, Deborah, we're not going right. to do a heavy one because you'll be peeling when your event's going on. Right. Or if I can have a little downtime. You know, you're like, we okay, can we're going to do it a little more aggressive. But the audience doesn't understand the levels of those peels. That you control it. Right. You have to control right. it. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we did a blue peel one time right. for you, which proved to be very successful. Right. There are wonderful laser peels to do. So it's um, a step-by-step -step process. And right. as you continue to continue with good skin care, and the Jesner peels, and as we can go a little more aggressive, depending on what your schedule is, it works. Right. And of course, the sun protection. I can't, I can't say enough about sun protection. You really can't. Those go hand in hand. So really, for audience out there, if they are in the beginning phases or the ending mm -hmm. phases <laughs> of the menopause, you know, it's very important to keep up with your, your skin care. Exactly. Um, get on a great clinical or, you know, there are some drugstore ones out there that work, equal, right. not equally, but work, work good for them right. as long as you're doing it on a exactly. daily basis. Exactly. You know, your sun protection and then the most importantly, have someone know your skin. Like for me, coming and getting my facials every three weeks is a, is a world of difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can tell when I don't go, when I have to skip a couple of appointments, mm -hmm. I feel like my skin has aged five years. You know, it's because the exfoliation's not there and the, you know, the treatment's not there. So I really, truly believe that's, you know, a lot of people go do a lot of the surgeries, but I really think keeping up with your skin system right. and your person that works with you, like my Judy, you know, makes the biggest difference in maintaining that glow, maintaining that youthful skin and, you know, eliminating some of the lines and, you know, sure. superficial. superficial. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, you know this because I take you through the process. Right. Absolutely. And you can tell your, um, your friends, the people you work with, what you do. Right. And, and pick a good uh, person who knows skin. Right. And who can, is qualified to do the more advanced peels because right. you will do them periodically throughout the year. And someone that listens to what you want, to your needs, exactly. which is what you're great at. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you always. It's a pleasure you stopping by. I get so many emails and it's such a delight because, you know, women are confused on their skin and the peels and what one really works and what they do. You're always so knowledgeable and so personable and we love you, our Judy. So thank you for coming by thank and you. sharing all your knowledge with us tonight on our set. Thank you. Okay. And you have to maintain a really good skincare regimen. You can't start it one day, skip four days. It's really not going to help ladies. So you really, really, really need to take care of your skin and do it on a daily basis. And you too can have that glowing skin that you want. 
It's fashion. It's beauty. I personally believe that every single person can do something. It's celebrity. And then you were starring in Whitaker Bay. Mm -hmm. Whitaker Bay, which was, of course, a North Carolina based show. It's fun. Holy so cow, fun. I'm on the Deborah Kennedy show. It oh doesn't get any good. It is cute. Join us here on Saturday nights at 9.30 on Access 21 for The Deborah Kennedy Show. Beauty from the inside out and the outside in. Yeah! <laughs>have leading plastic surgeon Dr. Kara Criswell answering your viewer question. Welcome Dr. Kara. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. We do have a question for you that came from one of our viewers out there. This is from Vanessa. Vanessa has dark circles under her eyes and she wants to know what she can do about these. There is a difficult problem and there's usually three different reasons for it. Number one is it's a hereditary pigment deposition in the skin. It's just some darkening of the skin and it's hereditary. Your mom may have it, your grandmother, your brother, they all may all have it. The second is that it's due to uh, the blood vessels underneath the skin being more visible with thinning of the skin or with actually with allergies, with nasal, with nasal congestion. So the treatments for the different reasons behind it can be very different. If it's just a pigment deposition, sometimes some chemical peels or lasers can actually assist with that, but really it's just some kind of cosmetics to cover that area. Right. The second is if there is actual congestion of the vessels, it could be an allergy. Someone could just need some antihistamines or some cold packs or you know decreasing that con venous congestion. The third is there's extra extra skin. And that's really can be treated two ways. One, surgically, meaning a lower blepharoplasty where you take out the extra skin, tightening it and making those vessels less visible. The other is to actually camouflage with fillers. If you have a deep tear trough in this area that actually looks more pigmented by plumping up the areas around it, you may camouflage it that way. Right, there's a lot of different answers and that means mm -hmm. there's a lot of different variations on what it could be individually. Exactly. So they need to consult with their, derma, their plastic surgeon, dermatologist, to, to really find what works for them. Exactly. But you gave us three great different scenarios. So one of those would fit, right? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much for Thank spending you. your time with us tonight. We hope Dr. Kara has answered your question. And send us as many questions as you like. And one time, yours is going to be on our show as the viewer question of the week. Hi, Deborah Kennedy here. If you or someone you know wants to be a guest on our show, it's as easy as going to the website at www.deborahkennedyshow.com, clicking on to be a guest, and you could be in the seat beside me on Saturday evening. Well, are you a professional in your field? Are you a person that wants to make a difference in the world? Or do you have a story that you want to share about losing weight or working out or makeup tips? We are looking for you. Remember, just visit our website and you could be a guest on The Deborah Kennedy Show. We are so excited tonight to have a very special guest as we introduce our design series and our special guest tonight is Mr. Josiah Culler. We're so excited to have you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be oh, here. We're looking forward to this. We are so excited about this segment because we always have amazing fashion segments, real life stories, but we've decided to incorporate a regular segment called our design segment. Awesome. And you're going to be our regular featured guest, so we're excited <laughs> to have you. Excellent. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that we want to talk tonight about is the designing of cabinets in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And it's really confusing on, you know, all the different choices that we have. Right. Whether we reface our cabinets, whether we repaint our cabinets, or totally replace our cabinets. 
So we're going to ask you a few questions since you are the design <laughs> expert in that sure, field, yeah. as well as many others. We want to talk about the difference in cost for replacing, right. refacing, or painting the cabinets. Now to reface, take the fronts off and replace all the fronts, yep. what is the cost of that? Well, you're it? probably looking at a range anywhere from $150 to $250 per opening. So that include all your drawers, uh, any false doors, the door fronts. So it could add up very quickly. So you figure an average kitchen with 20, 20 door openings and cost you anywhere from four to six thousand dollars. Right. So it adds up quick depending on the size of your kitchen obviously. So just to do that simple procedure four to six thousand yeah. dollars. Okay if we totally put new cabinets right. in a kitchen the same size what would the cost of that be on an average? Well you do have a, a very large scale there. Right. Um, you could get a very cheap press board cabinet with veneer on it and that would probably run you ten twelve thousand dollars in average size. Whereas some cabinets, most higher end cabinets are solid oak, solid wood. Those can cost you anywhere installed from forty to even sixty thousand dollars. So significantly more depending on the cabinets. Right. And what is the cost to repaint cabinets of that right, size right. kitchen? Well obviously it's gonna be a fraction of that. Right. You can do a, an average size kitchen again using the same the same cabinets, twenty cabinets for probably under $3,000, right. so significantly cheaper, obviously. Right, so it's amazing to me, and the, one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on is when someone told me that you could paint a kitchen and it would look great, I thought, mm, <laughs> it can look good. Yeah. But honestly, when your work is painted, it is a work of art. It Thank looks you. brand new. So to me, I think it's so informative to our viewers out there because I never envisioned that painting could really make the cabinets look brand new. So I think it's great to to bring this to our audience because it is confusing when right. you to do a, to redo a kitchen and a lot of people with real estate um, are not buying new houses, they're redoing their existing houses. But you can be confused, very confused on the prices and the difference of you know what you're getting and the cost of value. So tell me when you go look at a job, what are the few questions that you ask your uh, customers? Well, you want to look at the cabinets obviously originally first. If they're not in good shape, if they're irreparable, then you obviously would want to replace them. Um, and then you want to look to see the route they're wanting to go. Are they wanting to just freshen them up, the cabinets, clean up the kitchen, or do they want a complete different look to their, their kitchen? Either one of those can be accomplished depending on how you paint it. What finish you go with, you could use a faux finish, so such as a glazing, uh, a crackling, an antique look, or even a distressed look. So you really need to figure out um, what zone or where they're wanting to go with their kitchen. Certainly many options. So like a doctor, you really right. want to talk down, talk and see what the customer wants. Exactly. We're going to take a quick break, and as we go to break, I want to show some before and after pictures of a couple of the projects that you've worked on. Excellent. It's fashion. It's beauty. I personally believe that every single person can do something. It's celebrity. And then you were starring in Whittaker Bay. Mm -hmm. Whittaker Bay, which was, of course, the North Carolina Beach. It's trip. fun. Holy so cow, I'm on the Deborah Kennedy show. Oh it doesn't my get any good. It is cute. Join us here on Saturday nights at 9.30 on Access 21 for the Deborah Kennedy Show. Beauty from the inside out and the outside in. Yeah! <laughs> We're back with the amazing artist to the stars, Mr. Josiah Collar. We're talking about cabinets. And yes. you know, fashion is not just about clothes. It's about your house, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes you spend $1,000 on an outfit, wear it a season, you know, and give it away. Right. So you know, it's a small little price to pay to make your happiness, you know, in your kitchen. You spend a lot of the time in your kitchen. So we're talking tonight about cabinets. What is the one most common mistake people make with painting their kitchen cabinets? Probably the biggest one is the, the poor preparation involved before you paint them. If you don't get your cabinet sanded properly, thoroughly, you don't use a good primer, 
those cabinets are just going to peel, they're going to flake right off, they'll scratch, and so obviously you're not going to hold up as well. So that's definitely the most important part of the entire project. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. What makes painting cabinets adhere to the wear and tear of everyday life? Because my fear would be you paint your cabinets, you hit something and it's going to scrape right. off the paint. Right. What prevents well, that? Like, like we mentioned, sanding, good preparation, getting all the dust off after you sand, right. using a good oil base or a good shellac base primer is the key. A latex primer doesn't quite cut it because all the grease that's usually on your kitchen cabinets. Right. And then to top coat it, at least two top coats of a, either an oil or an alkyd paint. You don't want just a standard latex house paint because that's not going to hold up at all. Right. So specific paints for that. Very specific, mm -hmm. yes. Right. And do you feel painting the cabinets will make them last how many years? If you take care of them, you clean them regularly, you're not abusing them, obviously, right. you can get five, seven, even ten years out of a, a quality painted cabinet. Wow, about, long, about as long as you get off of right. veneers and you pay like what, $80,000 for veneers for your a team? Fraction. Just, and that's fashion too, right? <laughs> exactly. Right? <laughs> well, um, what is the one uh, biggest probably compliment that you've gotten from someone redoing their kitchen and redoing their cabinets? Well, wow. I'd say that probably the biggest compliment I get, probably even on a regular basis, is when they get to show other people those cabinets. Right. Owning my own company, a family-owned business, for them to tell other people and to recommend me is the biggest compliment because that means they're happy, they're satisfied, and they love passing my name along. So right. that, to me, is probably having that reputation is the best thing. Right. No advertising, just word of mouth. Right. Yeah. And 100%. happy customers. Exactly. If you don't you have happy know? customers, then what's the point of doing a work for them? So. Right. Exactly. So what is the prep time if you're doing a kitchen? What, how long can people expect to be out of their kitchens? Well, you could have anywhere from a smaller kitchen, two to three days. But to be honest, a larger kitchen, an average sized kitchen, at least a week. Because like, right. you want to have the good preparation. You want to have time for each coat of paint to dry. Right. And then you have to get all the doors back on. A good two or three days for all the paint to hard cure. That way you don't have to worry about scratching it or chipping it. Right. And ladies, I'll zoom in here. I just want to tell you, <laughs> did you hear that? A week out of the kitchen when that means no cooking, a whole week's vacation. So that alone means uh, get your kitchen repainted. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right, Josiah? You're right. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, we're so excited that you're here with us tonight. And for our next design feature, we're going to bring you back and talk about those pieces that get distressed or show pieces in the kitchen that really have a statement when you walk Excellent. in. Okay? Excellent. Sounds All right. good. So we hope you're going to come back and join us. Of course. Okay? Thank you. We hope you have enjoyed our new design segment with Josiah. And it's really about, you know, making an impact, really making a difference in your kitchen. What's best for you? Is it painting? Is it refacing? Or is it replacing? So we hope that we have given you the information that can make you help you make the right decision. Tonight, we have a beauty tip for you from the handsome Dr. Brian Criswell. Dr. Brian, we're excited you're with us tonight. Thank you very much. And we have a beauty question for you. Sure. Who is a good candidate for breast augmentation? That's a great question. There are two major groups of women who are great candidates for breast augmentation. The first is the woman who has just felt that her whole life she naturally wanted to be a little bit larger. Um, and she is generally a great candidate for breast augmentation. And the other group of women who are great candidates are women typically who've had children and they've lost a little volume after having children and maybe nurse their children. And they are a great candidate for a breast augmentation, sometimes combined with a breast lift. And those are both great candidates for breast augmentation. our national makeup artist and hairstylist on board who happens to be my personal makeup artist on the set and hairstylist and I love Miss Heather Richardson from Tata Cosmetics. Hi. Thank you for agreeing to answer some of our viewer questions tonight in reference to hair. My pleasure. Well the first one comes from a viewer Kathy 
she is having some loss of her hair and wants to know if you can rec recommend anything that can help her product wise, vitamin wise, or any type of help you can offer. Yes, absolutely. There are many things you can do these days um, that you can get over the counter. Um, I would suggest starting first with um, a vitamin called biotin, which is the active ingredient in a lot of hair loss products that are out there, such as nioxin, um, and it helps to strengthen the hair follicle and the hair and to promote growth. So that's one alternative. And then there's also um, a product called Nioxin, which I just mentioned, and uh, Rogaine, which both I'm a big advocate of. I think that they both work really well for promoting hair growth and strengthening. In case of hair loss, it will actually, if the follicle is able to reproduce hair, it will cause and stimulate growth. Okay, so the first one is a vitamin, so mm -hmm. she should try that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the name of that vitamin was? Biotin. Biotin. Mm -hmm. And the second one is a product. It's a shampoo or it's a treatment a, product? It's a treatment product. Mm -hmm. It's a shampoo, conditioner, and then a scalp treatment product called Nioxin. And then the third alternative would be Rogaine, um, which is for women as well as men these days. And right. I think all three of those, um, I wouldn't do, I would choose either Nioxin or the Rogaine. You don't need to do both. Right. But um, depending on the amount of hair loss, if it's pretty severe, I would just go straight for the Rogaine. Okay. So, Kathy, we hope that has answered your question tonight. And if for some reason those products and vitamins don't work, then we would advise you to see your physician because sometimes it is from something you're lacking in your body or, you know, we're not really experts on that part. So, if these things don't work, seek the experts out for the advice. And we hope that's helped you tonight.